In the south, it's where you can see seasons. You don't have snowfall to show you that, uh, that the seasons have changed. What we have is a progression of flowering plants, a progression of birds. For us, fall is the fall wildflower maxima, and the best place to see that is in longleaf pine sandhills. It's been called a charismatic forest, longleaf. There is something about it um, that uh, engages people. Migrating butterflies coming, uh, coming through in clouds uh, full of not just magnolias, but uh, sulfurs, fritillaries. It was the dominant species on a variety of sites, wet, dry, you know, different soils, and that didn't just happen by chance. It happened because it was the best species for those soils. When I was 13, I have very vivid memories of hunting with my father and other adults and, and their sons and daughters, and, and quail were everywhere. I mean, you went right out the back door and hunted, and, and this was before deer and turkey were on the landscape. Part of that ecosystem is not just the tree, it's the whole width and breadth of other uh, bird species, mammal species, reptiles, plants, understory that, that is lost without the longleaf pine being part of the system. And the wildlife that depend upon that ground cover and that very open nature of the longleaf system, which is lets a lot of sunlight down to the forest floor, if you allow that to change, by having it dominated by hardwood species or species that don't let that sunlight down to the forest floor. You start losing all of that ground cover. If you get into the south and you want to save the, uh, uh, you know, save the landscape and recreate the landscape that, uh, that was there, that, that, you know, that this part of the, uh, the country is based on, uh, that means saving longleaf. In uh, the mid-2000s, uh, this eclectic group of folks uh, decided to write a range-wide conservation plan for longleaf and this was the first time that all these different parties came together and said here's our roadmap and here's our goal of restoring eight million acres across the range. We've got foresters and biologists and ecologists and landowners all working together and NGOs doing boots on the ground work and getting everybody at the table together and talking longleaf and keeping the focus on the plan and the restoration on the landscape. The Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, we use the, the, the term of helping people help the land. And the longleaf pine is an, it's a natural resource. Whether it be indigo snake or whether it be the gopher tortoise, many other ones that rely upon that habitat of the longleaf pine for survival. The public was really starved for information, a lot of misconceptions about longleaf pine, um, and those were drilled down pretty deep. Longleaf Alliance is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is just everything longleaf pine. The Forest Service has a lot of different things we do research on, and a lot of different ecosystem types that we do research on. So we do a little bit more than $2 million a year of research on longleaf. So the council is very important to us, we're all, we always try to make sure that the research we are doing is research that's needed by, the, by landowners, by land managers, by um, folks trying to work with the whole spectrum of what's in the long leaf system. In 2010, we were awarded the National Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year Award for the United States uh, through the American Forest Foundation and the tree farm system. And we thought that was a real opportunity and also a gift for us to be able to represent not only Alabama, but also all the family woodland owners in the United States in terms of tree farm and uh, family ownership and those issues that are very important to, for family forests to remain family forests. Our range-wide plan for the first time established a numeric goal, very concrete, 8 million acres of longleaf. Not only want to meet that number, but we want to do it in a way that is ecologically uh, significant. Let's take land that's already there, that's in private hands, let's teach people how to care for that land, uh, and one of the w better ways of caring for it is to restore it to longleaf, uh, longleaf pine habitat. We also have the boots on the ground, is what I would say, is how do we get this done on the ground? We're not going to be successful unless we're putting trees in the ground. Workshops and field days and academies and 
just information, technical information to landowners. We have a team of practitioners that put fire on the ground, control invasive species, do mechanical treatments, monitor those, all of those different aspects. Soil Water Conservation District offices and NRCS offices are very, very important for technical support and as well as for cost share. And cost share is a big player in this whole scheme of things. We have people that go out on the land, work directly with these private producers to inform and to educate and to give them techniques or tools they may need, the private landowners may need, so they can do whatever they want to do, they need to do to meet their objective. We have financial incentive, which means financial resources that's made available. I'm on the Alabama Prescribed Fire Council, which is a council that promotes fire and educates people that are, don't know about it and to, and to increase the, the, the knowledge of it and turn and also by smoke and, and fire research. What about seedling supply that is specific to a certain area? You know, you may not want to uh, use longy pine seedlings from North Carolina to replant in, in Texas. A, a lot of things like that are mundane, are technical, that need to be addressed, that are all part of pushing this forward. Landowner to landowner, communication is extremely important. and. I get calls all the time from other landowners who are interested in long leaf that don't know about it. Uh, I have somebody come and say, well, I'm ready to plant long leaf and um, where can I get seedlings? And it's already December, January, and they haven't done any site prepping. So far, what the Long Leaf Partnership Council has achieved is a change in how the United States government is looking at uh, its priorities. I don't know anything about how, to, how deep to plant a longleaf seedling or uh, any of the other technical aspects, but the strength is that we have people from so many different walks of life and such different expertise. Yeah, we've heard a lot of folks talk about, well, for instance, maybe Nature Conservancy is trying to do some work with longleaf on a piece of property Someone else on the committee with, uh, say, Bob White Quail could say, well, hey, we could, we could work with you on that. So you're getting more than you would get if they didn't know each other, didn't talk about each other. They may work together on that to not just get long leaf on that piece of property, but really work to improve the habitat for Bob White Quail there in a way they wouldn't have if they, if they weren't talking to each other. NRCS. We as an agency, we believe in the collaborative approach. Hugh Hamlin Bennett, who was the father of, of soil conservation, uh, it was, he believed that, that nobody knew more about what their local needs are or were than the local people. And that's a vision, that's a dream we're trying to live out today. And I'm very excited about it. And as an agency, we're very excited about it. Why would you want to plant a small seedling that you may never in your lifetime see the benefit. Well, the benefit is to live it along the way and to enjoy the process along the way as it is growing into a large, big utility pole or a, a large tree that is going to house a, a rare species like red cockade woodpecker. The longleaf restoration and, and the longleaf ecosystem is a testament to, let's sit, wait, look and enjoy it along the way. Let's know that the benefits are, are there now, but also there's better benefits later on. Um, it built the South and portions of the country and portions of the world. The walking through the piney woods and the smells and all the different um, wildlife species and plant communities that are part of it were really ingrained in as a part of our culture. You know, the home I grew up in was built from Lonely Pine. So, I mean, there is a strong connection there um, historically, but it was just lost. It's special, it's a treasure to the South, but um, we have to get those pictures, those stories, all of that back into our literature, into the education system, share it with the youth in elementary education. I mean, those stories really aren't told any longer as they should be. So getting that back into the system, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, we all have to work together to make that happen.